Uh, well, thanks so much for putting together this uh, workshop. Uh, Benedetta, Jamil, Darik, uh, Yaroslav. Um, so the plan for uh, my lectures today is to, well, today and these three days, is to tell you about, um, you know, how to go from a collection of interacting quantum emitters, uh, uh, how to describe what happens at a single excitation level up to kind of the, uh, you know, many body levels and how to go about that. Um, so, as uh, Jamir said, please feel free to, to ask any question. The idea is that I'm going to show you a bunch of, like, uh, at least in this lecture, a lot of also experimental results. Uh, and I'm also going to go super slow. Uh, uh, as I saw in the program, there is uh, all kinds of people here, experimentalist theories, people working in spintronic, people working in quantum optics. So I'm sure for some of you, what I said, will say today will be trivial, for some others maybe less trivial, so I guess that's what questions are for. Okay, so let me start by the beginning. Um, so when I uh, look around at the state of the field of quantum science and, and technology, what I see is a huge diversity in, in the applications of quantum systems. Uh, so this can range from uh, quantum computation with uh, arrays of neutral atoms or superconducting qubits uh, to quantum simulation, uh, but also to uh, precision measurements. So uh, people interested in uh, using, for instance, arrays of or optical lattices of atoms to, to work as an optical clock or uh, to use uh, the spins of the atoms to, to squeeze them and measure better. Uh, there is also, of course, uh, in quantum optics interest in, in uh, communicating uh, between different uh, places, I guess, in the world. And so uh, this is where quantum networks come along. So when I, I think about all this diversity, there is not only diversity with respect to applications, but also with respect of the type of systems that serve as qubits. So here, some examples, again, are atoms or superconducting qubits. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can think a bit more broadly and think also about not only the, the systems that serve as qubits, but also the systems that uh, mediate interactions between these qubits. So I think in most of the, the examples before, uh, I showed uh, qubits talking via the vacuum of the electromagnetic field. Um, but you could start changing that uh, kind of that vacuum, so you can make it such that the interactions are not mediated by photons, but these photons may be in some uh, medium, such as a photonic crystal. Um, or you could start thinking about maybe mediating interactions in a collection of spins in a material via collective modes of the material itself, such as phonons uh, or plasmons. Uh, these are, this is another example where uh, here we have an, um, I think it's a silicon vacancy center. Um, uh, that is interacting with, uh, uh, with phonons. Uh, and you can think also of um, interacting uh, or me mediating interactions between qubits, between in particular MD centers, with magnets. And so actually, some of you guys in the audience have a very pretty paper about this. Okay, so if instead of looking at, you know, the huge diversity of systems that there, is, there are, I look instead of what makes them similar is that uh, I would, you know, highlight two things. The first one is uh, the goal. The goal of most of this work uh, is to control large quantum systems formed by many particles. Uh, and they, these applications or these, uh, these examples also share a common issue or a common challenge. That is that because we want to control these systems, these systems need to be open to the world. Okay, so these are fundamentally open quantum systems. And so uh, that's perhaps not shocking in the sense that if we have a collection or, you know, any quantum system is naturally connected to an environment. Uh, and this means that uh, in this environment, there's going to be vacuum fluctuations and these vacuum fluctuations um, cannot be switched off. And that's kind of good uh, because 
vacuum fluctuations generate coherent dynamics between particles, and these coherent dynamics can be exploited for quantum computing, for metrology, and for sensing. So I wanted to highlight a couple of recent uh, uh, papers. Uh, so on the, I guess, right, uh, there is a, this is an example uh, of a measuring cooperative lamp shift in an optical lattice clock. This is uh, work in Junge's group in Gila. And so the idea there is that they have a collection of atoms. Um, this collection of atoms forms a cubic lattice. Um, and the distance between the atoms is uh, smaller than the resonant wavelength of the atoms that is addressed. Um, and that means that now the atoms are going to see the environment, but also they are going to see other atoms via this environment. And this leads to a cooperative lamp shift um, that they can measure in the experiment. Um, there is another uh, recent example of harnessing coherent uh, dynamics mediated by vacuum, that is uh, the realization of a spin squeezing in a Rydberg atom array. Uh, so this is some paper of the group of uh, Antoine Blowways in collaboration with the group of Norman Yao. Uh, and so this is, again, an array of, uh, of uh, atoms. They are prepared in uh, Rydberg state. And then uh, there is uh, a squeezing that is produced because of the Hamiltonian or coherent interactions between these emitters. And the interesting thing here is that for the, I guess, one of the first times, uh, these uh, interactions are mediated by the free space uh, vacuum. So there is this power law type of interaction. So this is different from what happens in a cavity. And they see that this type of interaction also leads uh, to a squeezing. Okay, so all good. We have vacuum. It mediates interactions between qubits. And yes. Yes, I believe that's right. Yes, so then they are, uh, I believe these are uh, in the mic with a microwave transition. So basically the atoms, uh, the separation between them is of the orders of microns. But then with these microwave transitions, uh, the wavelength is enormous. So compared, you know, the distance between the atoms is very small compared to the wavelength of the resonant transition. And so then, um, in general, in vacuum, you have both, as I'm going to explain right now, you have both coherent and dissipative dynamics. But basically, because this, uh, the distance is very small, the dominant part is the coherent dynamics that comes from the near field, is 1 over r cubed. So where r is the distance between the atoms. And so that is very large, and this leads to this spin squeezing. But the interesting thing also is that this spin squeezing happens where the interactions are not really all to all, but they have this type of uh, power law. Yes. Is that correct that this is coherent? So these are coherent. coherent. Everything so far is coherent, yes. Or at least, let's say, assume to be coherent, to be more specific. Yes, in the sense that uh, obviously there is going to be correlated dissipation. I'm going to talk about this in a second. Uh, but uh, again, because either the particles are very close in one case, or in the other case, because uh, most of the, the evolution time is very short, and most of the deep phasing, in particular in the case of the clock, does not come from dissipation, comes from some you know, experimental decoherence effect associated to the lattice, then the dissipation is kind of thrown under the rug, and people don't very much talk about it uh, for this type. But I mean, I think, you know, our role is to actually ask, okay, this is great, this is, this is how coherent uh, effects are manifested, but then what happens with dissipation? And in particular, can you find optimal protocols where you maximize coherent interactions while you suppress dissipation, or vice versa, where you maximize dissipation and you suppress coherent interactions? So that, I'll talk about that, I mean, in a second, and then eventually we'll get there uh, like in lecture two and three. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. I kind of interrupted you, so I don't think I even let you ask my question. Okay, so okay, so um, we have this uh, type of interactions that uh, I said are, are assumed to be coherent, uh, but, uh, you know, 
the vacuum of the electromagnetic field does not only mediate coherent interactions between atoms, but it also mediates I mean, potentially long-range dissipative interactions. And these long-range dissipative interactions are going to give rise to decay. So if you have an atom and it's excited, after some time it's going to emit a photon and decay to the ground state. But now if we have a collection of atoms, this dissipation, this process of emission of photons becomes correlated. Um, and so that's correlated decay. And so when we think about correlated dissipation, we can think about uh, kind of, you know, there's two different ways to think about it. The first one is, you know, something horrible that we should get rid of, okay? Um, and so this may be the case. Uh, you may see the correlated dissipation in that way. If you care about uh, preparing some, you know, realizing some coherent protocol, so if you are doing some quantum simulation of Hamiltonian dynamics, or if you are uh, preparing some interesting entangled state or some other state with metrological advantage, uh, obviously decay is not going to be great because it basically is going to limit the time you have to both prepare the state and to measure with it. Um, in quantum computing, it's even uh, perhaps even worse. Uh, so if you have correlated decay um, in quantum computing, this kind of threatens quantum error correction. Uh, so quantum error correction just assumes like there is some constant error um, that appears in your quantum computer and you can correct for it if it's low enough. Uh, on the other hand, if as you scale the system, in particular, if we think about these Rydberg arrays, if as you scale the system, the probability of error scales super linearly with system size, uh, or if the error per particle scales with system size, then, you know, that's not going to be great and quantum error correction may not work. Um, so, you know, this, uh, how to think about correlated decay as a terrible thing that can happen to you. Uh, you can also think on uh, or interpret it uh, as something positive. So correlated decay, as I'll show you in, you know, uh, by the end of this lecture, it's very useful to actually protect a system from decoherence. So if now you have an ensemble of atoms, they can cooperate to hide themselves collectively and you can prepare, basically they can uh, realize a dark state. And so this dark state is a state that is protected from dissipation, and if you put information there, it may live forever. So that's good. Um, but also, uh, instead of trying to hide from dissipation, we can exploit it. Uh, so dissipation uh, leads to population decay, but from the perspective of optics, it also leads to radiation. So for instance, it's something that is really good if you want to uh, radiate a lot of photons. And in particular, if you want to generate new types of sources. Uh, so an example that uh, uses correlated decay is uh, super radiant lasing. So a super radiant laser is, uh, is a new type of laser, let's put it this way, where we have a collection of, uh, of atoms. Uh, these atoms are incoherently driven, which means that the drive is not, uh, you know, if you want, is not resonant with the atomic transition. It's some drive that is added at the Limbladian. Okay, it's not some sort of coherent rabbit drive. Um, the atoms are then uh, excited, and when they decay, they decay into a cavity. But this cavity is a bad cavity, meaning that it's some reservoir into which the atoms just uh, emit photons, and these photons fly away instantaneously. Okay, there is there is no memory in the cavity. Uh, yet. Uh, if you pump this system strong enough, eventually uh, it will radiate coherent light. Okay, so it's an example where coherence really arises from dissipation. Uh, and this is because what happens is, or at least how I understand it, is the atoms remember what type of photons they emitted and they want to emit it again. So there is some sort of, again, like coherence that arises, uh, even though you could imagine that the system may be uh, chaotic. Uh, and then the intensity of the light scales as n squared, where n is the number of particles. Uh, and then more recently, uh, well, this was an idea that was proposed, uh, I think, in the late, late 2000s and has been uh, recently realized in an experiment. Uh, then more recently, uh, there are other types of driven dissipative phase transitions that have been proposed. So this is an experiment in the group of uh, 
Antoine Brouwens, where uh, this is without any cavity. Uh, you take a, a disordered cloud of atoms, you drive them, in this case coherently, and above certain threshold, there is uh, a transition from what is called magnetized to super radiant uh, uh, state or phases. Uh, and they claim that this transition can be seen in the forward direction by looking at the intensity. And this transition again happens because of correlated dissipation. Uh, I should say that this paper is a bit contested right now. Uh, I think Derek has a paper on it. Uh, by now there are like five papers on it, two of them with Antoine uh, as a co-author that says that this uh, phase transition is not exactly such a phase transition. And this comes again from, or I mean, there are many reasons for that, but uh, one thing that hopefully is clear after these two lectures is that there are a bunch of, uh, you know, there is a lot of phenomenology and theory, uh, in particular also phase transitions that has been realized since the, you know, 50s on for atoms in cavities. Uh, but then when we think about atoms in free space or in more complex, let's say, environments, one has to really rethink all these uh, ideas, okay? So translating something from a cavity to free space directly is a very scary uh, thing to do. So uh, that's something, yeah. Yes. Um, yes. I have a question. So uh, when we think about magnetic fields, like this thing that you have here, that's right. Sorry, I didn't mean no temporal. No. Ah, yes, yes. So it's a Markovian noise. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's not that this. Yes. Yes. But the real magnetic state of the field is like the magnetic field. Yeah, yeah, non Markovian, exactly. Yes, yes, I agree. Yes, yes. So I I cannot claim at all that, you know, this type of spatially correlated errors kill quantum error correction. It's just like then you have to work hard because then you have to go to a decoherence free subspace. Yeah. For instance. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, and everything I'm gonna talk about is actually about uh memoryless reservoirs. So, so That's, that's very fair, yes. I'll have a slide about this, which is by no means extensive at all, but then maybe we can uh, recover this discussion. Uh, I mean, just maybe for the record, I think I know how to deal with uh, the unknown Markovian bath at the level of a single excitation. Besides that, obviously there are ways, but uh, not any that I can claim to be an expert on. So maybe there are people in the audience that know way more than me. So, yeah, that's a very good point. I, I have a slide about this. So, to claim that now it's uh, a new era is both, uh, I think, uh, true and a lie, uh, in the sense that people obviously have thought about extended systems before, also in free space. But, uh, you know, if we go back to the origin of the story of like correlated dissipation, I would highlight the, the work of Dickey in 1954. So, that is you know, a collection of atoms in a bath cavity, collectively decaying, and then there is a burst of energy that escapes as an square, etc. cetera. Uh, and then uh, since that, in particular in the 70s and 80s, there is a lot of work of what happens in extended systems. So, I mean, any quantum optics person you think about has thought about super radiance in an extended uh, sample. But I think, probably because of the technology or the experiments back in the day, 
they typically think about the disorder club, um, where there is less, is a bit more, um, you know, it's not so obvious that interference matters so much as if you have an order system. And so then uh, this field has kind of uh, taken off again very recently because of the development of optical lattices and atomic arrays uh, trapped with optical tweezers, where people have started using, well, now what happens if you really have indeed an extended system, but I can pinpoint where each atom is and it's some order lattice. So in my view, but this may be different if you ask somebody else, I feel that we are a bit in the stage of we can get to do condensed matter type of problems uh, because uh, disorder systems are a mess, in particular disorder systems with many excitations. Um, but then maybe order systems can be more understood and with that, maybe we can go backwards in some sense. Okay, so then uh, just uh, because I thought there would be perhaps more students here, but you know, uh, if you're not a student, you may also enjoy this slide. I just wanted to highlight, uh, how I understand, you know, this idea of correlative dissipation and coherence and who I think when I, when I think of people that I like uh, you know, to read how they think about physics. Uh, these are two people that come to mind. So, well, Roy Glauber is one of the fathers of the theory of optical coherence for which he won a Nobel Prize. And Ilya Prigogin, uh, he won a Nobel Prize in chemistry and he's the developer of, uh, you know, the notion of the arrow of time or one of the people that put that forward. Uh, and he was interested in developing a theory of what he called dissipative structures. Uh, so, you know, uh, Glauber has amazing uh, lectures from Les Bush, so if you read them, it's really uh, illuminating. And Ilya Prigogin has a bunch of books. I mean, he has his novel lecture and obviously his papers, but he also has a bunch of kind of popular science books that are just beautiful to read and very mind-opening. And so I wanted to highlight two sentences of, well, one sentence of each of them. The first one is uh, Roy Glauber says that all of the delicate and ingenious techniques of optics are exercises in the constructive use of knots. And then via the fluctuation dissipation theorem, I can claim dissipation. So basically, noise and dissipation, you cannot get rid of it, but uh, you, know, you can perhaps manipulate it and harness it for the other purpose. Uh, and then Ilya Prigogin, in one of his books, writes, uh, that irreversibility gives rise to a plethora of phenomena, in particular it leads to coherence, to effects that encompass billions and billions of particles. So he's interested in how systems that are out of equilibrium may develop a coherence precisely because of irreversible processes. Okay, so then this kind of maybe the most philosophical slide. Uh, the next slide actually may answer uh, Tamir's question, of like, why now? Uh, and the reason is, as I said before, Back in the day in quantum optics, people cared about um, you know, clouds of many, many particles, but they are difficult to understand theoretically. Uh, and also many of the interesting effects are washed out. Uh, and also, uh, of course, since the uh, 80s or maybe before even, uh, people learned how to manipulate or to place atoms in cavities. Uh, so these atoms, uh, so this is a system where, you know, perhaps more fascinating things can happen, but uh, it's also in some sense simplified because you have a bunch of atoms and potentially a bunch of excitations, but only one single electromagnetic mode. Uh, and that simplifies the system tremendously. So I wouldn't call this an extended system because basically uh, in a cavity QED setup, there is permutational symmetry uh, between the atoms. Uh, and this leads to a huge simplification of the problem. Uh, but then now, uh, nowadays, people are able to trap atoms into beautiful order lattice, uh, lattices. And then the natural question is, you know, what is new in this system? So, so maybe not what is new, or maybe we have to look at what was done before, but then uh, what happens in this uh, context of, uh, you know, perhaps more modern many body quantum optics? And how should we describe systems like this one? Okay, so then, uh, this is just to say that this is not really science fiction. Uh, people have been developing this type of, uh, you know, experiments involving array, atom arrays, or also superconducting qubit arrays, um, interacting with, with uh, the optical field or the microwave field. So these are two recent examples. So on the right, 
uh, there is an experiment of uh, Emmanuel Bloch and Johannes Seifer's lab, uh, where they have trapped um, a lattice of atoms. Now the, the distance between the atoms is again subwavelength. And what they do is they come with some field that is orthonor, uh, sorry, orthogonal to the lattice, the propagation. And what happens is that this single layer of atoms be behaves as a perfect mirror, at least for a theorist, and at least when this lattice is infinite. Uh, in the experiment, they achieve, this is 2020, they achieve 60% reflectance, which is still pretty impressive. Uh, also, I don't think they have that many atoms. I don't recall exactly a number. I don't know if Derek, you remember, but it's maybe, I don't know, probably less than 10 by 10. Anyway, so anyway, so that's one reason. The other reason is that atoms, these atoms are trapped, and then there is like some, uh, basically the excited state is anti-trapped, this, this lowers the reflectance. But that's still pretty impressive that a single layer of atom can reflect light pretty perfectly. Uh, and then um, this other experiment, this was done in the group of uh, Gerhard Kirsmeyer in Innsbruck. Uh, and here you have a, a microwave uh, transmission line. Uh, you have pairs of superconducting qubits, uh, transmox, uh, and basically they are placed in uh, at a distance at which uh, there are what are called bright and dark states. So these states are collective states from the qubits. Uh, some of them decay rapidly, these are called bright or super radiant. Some of them decay slowly, these are called dark or sub radiant. And what they manage is to access in from from the side, they manage to drive these dark states. So you see the ground to the dark state. And this dark state is a state that lives 300 times more than a single excited qubit. So they are able to prepare it and to probe it. And these are Rabi oscillations between the ground and the dark state. Okay, so these two uh, papers in different contexts with different frequencies, again, microwave optical, neutral atom superconducting qubits, both of them, uh, Basically, the mechanism by which they work is interference. Um, and I would like also to say that we shouldn't perhaps be very surprised by this, because even though this works at the single photon level, these platforms are classical in some sense. The sense that if I replace these uh, cool quantum objects by just nanoparticles, this effect would remain exactly the same. Um, there is a recent report that I saw in Daimop uh, uh, that maybe Susan can tell us more about. Uh, some recent preliminary results by Marcus Greiner's group in Harvard on many body superradiance in an Erbium lattice. So this is kind of going back to this comment of uh, Dicky superradiance and many body superradiance. This is really a phenomenon that comes uh, in a system that has many excitations. And this has been reported for the first time in a lattice. I don't know how many atoms do they have, so so do you know? So it's like 10 by 10 lattice or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So this is to say, I mean, this was reported, it's not public, it's, it was reported in Daimop. I guess two weeks ago, and this to say that these experiments are really being, we're scratching the surface. So um, it's something that is really uh, kind of new. Okay, so with this uh, very long, I guess, uh, introduction, here is a bit a lecture plan of uh, what's gonna happen this week. Uh, today, I'll talk about uh, how to describe these systems via spin model, where I'll discuss spontaneous emission, uh, I'll introduce a theoretical description of many atoms talking to each other via Green's functions, and I will discuss actually some approximations that you need to derive uh, the spin model. On lecture two, I'll talk about few excitation physics, so basically physics of super and sub radiance. Uh, I will discuss this experiment that I showed in the previous slide, <clears throat> and I'll introduce the concept of selective radiance and how to harness it to realize applications. So basically, this is a way uh, by which you can have a collection of atoms talking strongly or efficiently to some optical mode you care about and talking in a subradiant way to any other mode. And that enhances the efficiency of many quantum products. And I'll talk about, in particular, quantum memories. And then lecture three, in particular, I think the most fun, 
I'll talk about medieval physics. Uh, here I'll just refer to some adventures in kind of the deeper Hilbert space. I cannot claim that I totally understand what's the medieval physics of these systems, but we've made some strides, so I'll discuss that on the lecture soon. Okay, so then uh, before my time runs off, uh, let me tell you about uh, you know what the lecture of today is about. I'll discuss some basics of what you know basics of these uh, kind of atomic systems, and then I'll talk about the theoretical description of their interactions with the spin model. Okay, so when I talk about atoms, you have to think uh, broadly. So atoms for me are atoms. They can be molecules. They can be superconducting qubits. Uh, they can be empty centers, etc. Uh, in general, uh, these type of systems are quite complex. They may have a lot of different levels. So for me, for neutral atoms, you may have the fine and the hyperfine structure, very complicated. Uh, then between these levels, there will be transitions. Uh, these transitions are uh, have to obey some selection rules, so certain polarizations are coupled to some levels and not to others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but you can isolate a particular transition with a magnetic field, uh, and that's why we can, at least at a toy model level, say this a two-level atom, even though it may be a very scaly-looking creature. Um, so for superconducting qubits, uh, these are uh, basically harmonic oscillators, uh, LC circuits that. Uh, are coupled to a Jacobson junction that makes them unharmonic, and then we can isolate from the whole spectrum two levels, and this is uh, again a two-level system. And then for uh, MB centers, uh, they have also a bunch of uh, of, uh, of levels, but then in the ground state there is a spin triplet, uh, and so you can couple the MS0 level to either the plus one or minus one. Uh, that can be split in the presence of a magnetic field. Uh, just uh, for the record, I said that neutral atoms mean have all types of frequencies, of course, resonance frequencies, but typically uh, I like to think about them in terms of optical frequencies, so hundreds of terahertz. Uh, superconducting qubits, uh, they operate in the microwave uh, domain, so this is gigahertz, uh, and the same happens uh, for this uh, MB centers, uh, this transition is, I believe, 2.8 gigahertz. Okay, so these are some examples of two level systems. These are, on the other hand, some examples of environments or paths. I said before, well, we have uh, free space. These are actual experiments of atom arrays uh, created with optical tweezers, and these atoms will talk about uh, with each other via the free space uh, modes. Uh, we can engineer the, the the propagation of the field, both uh, spatially and spectrally, by uh, via dielectric uh, structures. So this is an example uh, of a paper where uh, uh, we explore what happens when you trap atoms close to a photonic crystal. Uh, so this photonic crystal is just uh, some dielectric structure where the refractive index is periodically modulated, and this opens bands for light. So you will have regions in the frequency space where you will have photons that can propagate and regions where there is no mode. And this means that there will be regions for which you know, an atom can emit a photon, so there is this dissipative dynamics, and there are regions where this is not allowed, so the dynamics becomes coherent. Um, this is another example of another engineered vacuum uh, where um, Superconducting qubits are coupled via 1D transmission line. Yeah. 10 minutes? Really? Oh, okay. Um, and then, very rapid, then I have to run. Uh, so, uh, this is a very uh, cool paper by several of our organizers on uh, thinking about different types of uh, qubits and bats. So, this is a bunch of spins coupled, uh, the spins are in the centers coupled via magnums in an yttrium iron garnet field. Okay. okay, so then, very quickly, we're going to consider a toy model where we have two-level systems, so ground and excited state. There is a frequency difference uh, or energy difference between them, h bar omega zero. For optical transitions, this energy gap is much larger than the thermal excitation, therefore we, or the temperature basically, we can completely ignore thermal excitations in the excited state. 
Um, and if the atom is not illuminated, we assume that it is in the ground state. On the other hand, if we have a bunch of atoms, uh, the ground state is trivial. It's just a product of all atoms in the ground state. Uh, this may be different if you are, for instance, in a different bath, uh, or if you have uh, emitters with a different um, frequency gap. In that case, you would need to cool. So that's why superconducting qubits experiments are done in the Lucian phase of generators. Um, as I said, these systems are open, which means that the dynamics is no longer Hamiltonian. So if instead of thinking about the evolution via Schrodinger equation of a pure state, we have to think of a density operator or density matrix that is evolving via a master equation, uh, which will be of the lean platform, precisely because of that Markovian uh, uh, approximation. Yeah, yeah, there is more Markov, yeah, yeah. If I manage to get there, then I will. Yeah, okay, so then uh, just uh, because these atoms, these systems are coupled to the environment, uh, when they are excited, they will emit a photon, um, and this emission is driven by vacuum fluctuations, and these photons will be detected in a random direction, and when we average over all these detection processes, we'll recover an average dipole pattern, so we can think of this process as, you know, we place the atom in the excited state, uh, there will be uh, some time at which our detector doesn't click, and then eventually it clicks, and we know that we have projected the atom from the excited to the ground state via this jump operator. So if we do this experiment again, what happens is that this jump occurs at random times, and again and again, and then when we average, we get the typical uh, exponential decay of population, where the spontaneous emission rate is dominated or determined by the environment. So this means that uh, if we change the environment, this is going to change the propagator of the electromagnetic field, and in particular the local part of that propagator, this is the Green's function, and this is what determines the spontaneous emission rate in vacuum. If we now put an atom close to a mirror, this is going to change the spontaneous emission rate, and we will have to rewrite the Green's function in this geometry. And then this also means that this is going to change the interactions between the particles. So if, for instance, we place the atoms in a cavity, this will give rise to all-to-all -all interactions. And as I said, this permutational symmetry makes the problem easy. But now if we have them in free space, this will give rise to some power law interaction range where the interactions depend on distance, the permutational symmetry is broken, um, and then this interference in photon emission absorption will give rise to interesting physics. Okay, so then... Very quickly, uh, how we get to the spin model. Uh, so typically, if we think about uh, how to, you know, integrate out degrees of freedom such that we get to a master equation, the typical st starting point is some Hamiltonian that takes into account all degrees of freedom. So for instance, if we're considering the electromagnetic field, we'll have a collection of normal modes. Uh, if we are thinking about some other, you know, environment that is like some collective modes of some medium, this would be these operators will describe that. Uh, then we'll have the matter Hamiltonian, which is the second term. And then we'll have this coupling. Okay, so here I'm choosing this uh, electric dipole type of interaction. Uh, so the problem scales very poorly because if we have n particles, the dimension of the Hilbert space is 2 to the n times the dimension of the Hilbert space of the path degrees of freedom. Uh, for free space, this is infinity, so that's pretty trivial. So what we do is we integrate out, and you know this makes the problem easier in some way. Um, and so under the Born and Markov approximation, which I'll discuss in the next slide, what we do typically is we integrate out the photonic degrees of freedom. So we have a system with a small number of degrees of freedom, a reservoir with many, and we trace over the reservoir, and we end up with a master equation of the Lindblad type that only depends on the spin degrees of freedom. Uh, and where the, the field degrees of freedom do not appear, they only appear as determining some couplings between the spins in the form of path correlators of this type and the permission model. So when is this valid? So we go back to uh, this question. So uh, the Born approximation works whenever we have weak couplings. So this is a second order perturbation theory. So we expect that the coupling between the photons uh, and the atoms is weak compared to the system energy, which is given by omega zero. So that's uh, for optical frequencies, very easy to achieve. And uh, now let's get to more you know, difficult problems. Uh, 
the first one is a Markov approximation requires a memory less reservoir. Uh, so uh, people discuss the Markov approximation in the context of time. I prefer to think about it in the context of frequency. So what this is telling you is that Markov approximation works if you have a very broadband reservoir. So imagine that you have uh, an atom in a cavity, and this cavity is very high Q cavity. So basically, the photons live there for a very long time. This means that it's a very narrow cavity. So we will be in this type of picture. Uh, this, in that case, the cavity cannot be integrated out. And the dynamics that uh, occurs is mostly Hamiltonian and re reversible. This is the James Cummings type of interaction where you have oscillations and revivals in the excited state population of the, of the atom. On the other hand, if you have a very broadband type of reservoir, so a multi-mode broad cavity, uh, this is where the Markov approximation can be performed because this, the cavity really behaves as a reservoir. And then, uh, so again, in free space, this is again very easy to realize. If you start modifying your vacuum, you may have problems. For instance, if you uh, look at a photonic crystal, uh, you, start, you may start breaking this type of uh, approximations because there may be band edge effects. And so you have to be careful, uh, think about the spectrum of your reservoir and see if you can do that. Uh, and then the third uh, approximation is that there is no retardation. So the resulting equation that we obtain is time local. Um, so what this means is that this will not work if I have an atom and you know somebody by the end of the room has the other atom. We cannot derive this type of master equation. Uh, what it in, is implied is that the propagation that it takes for you know the excitation to arrive to the second particle is much smaller than the time of decay. And this imposes some conditions on the distance regarding also with respect to the speed of light uh, in the medium or of the speed of the propagate of the excitation in the medium uh, and also the inverse of the time of decay that is the spontaneous emission rate. So for atoms in free space, as long as they are separated by less than one centimeter, we're good. In a vacuum chamber, we're good. But then uh, this cannot be done, again, if we are thinking about quantum networks where we have a system of particles here and another is kilometers away. So this is all I have to say about uh, approximations. OK, so. Uh, Instead of uh, doing this procedure that I discussed before, uh, we can uh, take another approach, uh, which is the previous procedure of integrating out the modes is easy if we understand what are the modes of the system, if they are easy to describe analytically. But what if you have some complicated creatures, such as what is called the alligator photonic crystal? Uh, it's like, good luck describing these modes, both spectrally and spatially, uh, and then integrating them out. So what you do instead is to solve the electromagnetic problem first and then care about the quantum mechanical problem. And so how do we solve the electromagnetic problem? Uh, we do that via the Green's function. So uh, to do this properly, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a reference. Uh, uh, you know, it's a bit of a hassle, so I'm not going to do it properly. I'm just going to give you some intuition about how to go about it or how to think about it. So the first thing is like, let's get rid of quantum mechanics. Let's just think of classical dipoles. And now uh, what I have is a bunch of, of classical dipoles that are driven. This induces a dipole. Uh, and then they scatter the drive field. And so the field at a given particle uh, is the pump field plus the scatter field. And the scatter field, except for some constants, is the dipole of some other particle times the Green's function, which is the propagator of the field, of the interaction between particles. Uh, so this Green's function is, uh, is a tensor, basically because electromagnetism is vectorial. So a dipole in X produces a field in X, Y, or Z. Um, and you find it because it's the fundamental solution of the wave equation in the medium. So you derive this equation, this Helmholtz equation, via from Maxwell's equations. Uh, and this, uh, the medium is characterized by this epsilon. This is where you build your boundary uh, conditions uh, that describe your medium. And then you solve it. You solve the electromagnetic problem. 
this may be easier or hard, but in principle it's not as hard as you know the quantum mechanical problem. Uh, and once you find it, uh, then you do something with it. So it's very tempting uh, to say, well, if now you have a collection of classical dipoles, I can write the Hamiltonian as the dipole times the field. And then, you know, plugging this there directly and doing some brutal approximations that are not correct, then the Hamiltonian looks like the dipole of particle J, the dipole of particle I, times the propagator between I and J. So, if uh, now we try to do this uh, in a quantum mechanical way, um, the typical thing to do is to promote the complex numbers to operators. And this gives rise to an input-output equation that gives me the output field via, you know, uh, uh, an input one. The input one is this TP. This is the positive uh, frequency component of the field operator. And then what I've done is that I've transformed the dipole, uh, the classical dipole, into a quantum dipole. And this quantum dipoles, quantum dipole is basically the dipole matrix element that tells me about the strength of some given transition times some operator, sigma minus, that takes the atom from the excited to the ground state. Uh, and then I've done here the Markov approximation. So omega is no longer some free frequency. It is the resonance frequency of the atom. And here I'm banking on the fact that the uh, reservoir is very broad. And spectrally, the only spike that I have is the resonance frequency of the particle. So this... Uh, equation looks very similar to the previous one because classical and quantum fields propagate identically. And this is because both have to fulfill Maxwell's equations. So to do this properly, there is a lot of work in the late 90s and early 2000s by Welsh woman and co-authors. And there is a very cool book called uh, Dispersion Forces where this is all written down. So again, it's very tempting to do this thing where I take the Hamiltonian that I wrote before, I do the Markov approximation, and I put these hats, and then this is my Hamiltonian for the dynamics. Uh, but obviously this is not correct because I'm missing parts of the evolution. My evolution cannot, cannot only be Hamiltonian. So then I have to again trace over the reservoir, do things properly, and when I do that, I find this type of master equation. Uh, where I have a coherent term that is Hamiltonian and a dissipation term. And so this coherent term uh, looks like this, sigma plus i, sigma minus j. So it's basically whenever atom i decays, atom j picks up an excitation. So it's this type of spleen deep Hamiltonian. And this, is a com this happens at a rate that is given by the real part of the Green's function, that is the propagator between atom i and atom j. Uh, and the dissipation is also correlating, so absorption of photons, or sorry, in particular, emission of photons is also correlated. There is a gamma ij that is not diagonal, so it takes into account the distance between the particles. So um, this is basically an xy model, uh, but it's not just a trivial xy model because it is long range and also uh, open. Um, as I said, finding the Green's function in some cases is easy if there is enough symmetry, so in free space, uh, close to a mirror, etc. If you go to some complicated structure, you could always solve it via numerical solver of Maxwell's equation, so that's an you know, easy problem. Uh, and then on top of this type of uh, master equation, you can add arbitrary complications. So if you have hyperfine structure, some complex internal structure, you can plug that in. If you have inhomogeneous broadening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you want to describe chiral reservoirs, non-reciprocal reservoir, if it's non-reciprocal, exactly this doesn't work. But you can derive a new one that works for a non-reciprocal reservoir. So you know the procedure is always the same: is you find the propagator of your excitation, which for me is the electromagnetic field, but for others maybe some other excitation, uh, and from there you derive this master equation. So actually, this is what. Uh, some of our colleagues here did uh, for these uh, MV centers coupled to magnums. Uh, so they find this master equation after tracing over a bunch of stuff uh, where J and gamma are explicitly given by these expressions here. 
uh, which depend basically on the geometry. This is a 2D plane, so this is very natural that, uh, I mean, I didn't go through all the math, but I believe it because these are the typical Western functions that appear in 2D. Uh, there is a term here that is correlated absorption, that it is because basically these are, uh, this is, uh, these MB centers, again, have a frequency uh, splitting that is on the gigahertz. So there might be thermal excitations. And so there may be magnons present if you don't cool down the temperatures of the backing up. Therefore, this now the system can also absorb magnons uh, and this absorption may be correlated. Okay, and then the last thing I want to say is that uh, we can describe this type of master or this master equation evolution in terms of what is called the non Hermitian Hamiltonians within the formalism of quantum trajectories. Um, so the idea is you look at this type of terms in the uh, Limbladian and you have a term that looks like rho sigma plus sigma minus, minus sigma plus sigma minus rho. So this looks very similar to this commutator of the Hamiltonian with the density matrix. So you could think about, about regrouping these two terms into the Hamiltonian. And now the master equation is gonna read like this, with this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian plus some jump terms. And this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian looks like this. And when we unravel J and gamma in terms of the Green's function, it looks very similar to what we postulated by hand before. So that kind of makes sense. Of course, this is not all the uh, evolution there is. We have the quantum jumps that tells me, you know, I have to, when this evolution is non-Hermitian and I'm losing norm in my quantum state, this norm is going somewhere and it is projected to some other state via the quantum jump. And so for a single atom, this Hamiltonian uh, looks like this. It's just this uh, imaginary type of, um, Hamiltonian, which is a weird thing to say. Uh, and this means that after some time, if we place an atom in the excited state, the population of the excited state will decay at a rate that is gamma ii, which is the spontaneous emission rate of this environment, uh, determined by this environment. Okay, so just very briefly, uh, once, because we have the input-output equations, we can also retrieve arbitrary correlation functions of the field, uh, which will become correlation functions of the spin operators. Uh, so that's kind of cute because making different measurements on, on the field, we retrieve uh, information about the spins. Uh, and then this, I think I'll just talk about it in the next uh, talk, uh, in the next uh, uh, lecture. So just as a summary, vacuum fluctuations give rise to interactions between the spins. Different boundary conditions alter these interactions. They may be more coherent, more dissipative. Uh, the range of interaction is also changed. Uh, this dramatically impacts the physics, both single particle and many body. Uh, and we are going to be interested in this type of systems where there is a large uh, density of uh, emitters and the system or the physics becomes that of a strongly interacting out of equilibrium problem. And so for lecture two, what we're going to do is look at single and free excitation physics. We'll talk about dispersion relations in of excitations in order arrays, uh, both at the, you know, uh, we'll think about single excitations, but also two excitations. And then we'll think about uh, applications. So this is the mirror that I discussed before, uh, and I'll talk also about quantum memories and how to improve their efficiency exponentially. So I think with this, I'm done. Uh, yeah, so then also as yesterday, there were so many questions, uh, well, I hope uh, the same for today. Um, so feel free to interrupt me, and I also try to make my less slides, so then uh, we'll get there hopefully in time. Uh, okay, so just uh, as a brief uh, recap, uh, yesterday I showed uh, this couple of experiments, both of them performed in this uh, single excitation limit or basically uh, a limit where, uh, you know, the, the system is driven very weakly by, by light, either optical or microwave. Uh, as Suzanne went on, uh, you know, into a lot of detail about the functioning of uh, this atomic mirror, so I won't discuss that. Um, uh, but I will, I will talk about uh, this dark and, and bright state.
it's both in free space and in wave connectivity. So, as I mentioned in the previous slide, if we have a kind of interacting system that we describe via some Markovian, uh, well, where, where the environment is Markovian, we can describe it via spin model with a Lindblad master equation, where we have a uh, we have a Hamiltonian uh, part that conserves the number of excitations, and then we have this uh, kind of dissipator part. Um, uh, which uh, describes collective decay. Um, I also mentioned that uh, it's also possible to diagonalize this uh, this matrix of this static couplings gamma ij into uh, collective modes, and so these collective modes uh, are uh, here written as collective transition rates uh, because this matrix is uh, positive semi-definite. These these transition rates are positive, and this makes sense because the system decays at a given rate that is positive. Uh, you know, things do not decay at minus 2 megahertz. Uh, and I also have written uh, this dissipator in terms of collective young operators, where uh, basically whenever an excitation is lost from the system, it does so at, uh, you know, by, by preparing a superposition state where each single spin decayed. Uh, and um, this superposition is weighted especially with the eigenvectors of the previous uh, matrix. Okay, so uh, this is how to write uh, this uh, master equation, but we can unravel this master equation in terms of uh, what are called quantum trajectories. Uh, so for this, what the first step is to rewrite this master equation in terms of uh, non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Um, so now the master equation looks like this. So we have um, a term that is uh, given by this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian uh, that is basically, I mean, um, fundamentally what it describes is that if you have a quantum system that you're monitoring, so for instance, you have an atom and you put a detector, um, this, you either have two choices, you know, if you're monitoring the system, uh, the detector either clicks or not. So clicking corresponds to uh, the system performing a quantum jump, and it would be one of these kind of like dash lines there. But then in between, the system is also evolving. Um, and it's because in you know, quantum optics, there is evolution, because uh, not clicking means also that you're acquiring information about the system. And so that evolution is captured by this non-Hermitian Hamilton. Okay, so then uh, once you've written the master equation like this, you can uh, unravel this into what are called quantum trajectories, where instead of evolving uh, a density matrix, you evolve a pure state. Um, and then this pure state evolves via the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Uh, and at random times, you have to apply quantum jumps. Okay? And then when you average over many of these quantum trajectories, you, you obtain the, the description given by the master equation. Okay, so in particular, our uh, non-Hermitian Hamiltonian uh, looks like this. Um, where it's written in terms of the propagator between uh, spin i and spin j. And again, it's this type of a spin flip uh, Hamiltonian that is an xy uh, type of one. Um, and then this uh, non Hermitian Hamiltonian is excitation conserving. So again, every time that a spin goes down, another goes up. So the number of excitations is always preserved in the dynamics if we don't look at the jumps part, uh, which means that uh, um, the number of excitation operator, which is just how many spins are up, uh, commutes with the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. And it means that now we can look at uh, the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian uh, by blocks of fixed excitation. And we can choose to diagonalize that and look at the basically eigenstates with a fixed excitation density. So this is what we're going to do. Any questions so far? Any of this? Everything is clear? Okay, so then let's uh, let's talk about uh, first uh, setting up the stage for atomic arrays, both in free space and um, in you know coupled to a one D path. So we're going to discuss uh, this type of system. So we have order of lattices uh, of atoms, but in principle this could be again molecules, or you can think of uh, some defects in some solid. 
uh, we're going to consider that these uh, arrays are in free space, but similarly, you could think of a bulk medium with some dielectric constant okay, um, that is very large. Uh, and then uh, these arrays, as I said, are ordered, so the lattice constant is this uh, little d. And, and the interactions between them are going to depend on, obviously, this, uh, this distance. So um, I've written here the dissipative uh, matrix elements, uh, gamma ij, so the dissipative couplings between these uh, atoms um, that are written in terms of the imaginary part of the propagator. Uh, so just for uh, you know, naming purposes, here I've written uh, uh, gamma zero, which is a spontaneous emission rate in vacuum, so it's proportional to the frequency to the cube and you know, the dipole matrix element squared, et cetera, et cetera. K0 is the uh, resonance frequency of the atomic transition divided by C. Uh, and so I introduce it because it's a natural length of the problem, or, or inverse length. Um, and then this uh, uh, Green's function looks like this creature here. So again, this is nothing sophisticated at all. You open a textbook in electromagnetism, ask what is the field at any point generated by a dipole, and this is the expression for it. Um, it has, you know, uh, the wave as it propagates the field. Uh, uh, this is captured by this exponential uh, phase uh, factor, and you have the typical terms that appear as one over r cube, one over r square, one over r, which are the typical near field, far field, and I guess in between field uh, that uh, uh, describes the radiation of a dipole. And then the last thing is that this is uh, generically a tensor because again, um, this projected onto the, you know, uh, the dipole matrix element of the atom. So this uh, basically set a quantization axis with a magnetic field. This fixes the kind of polarization of your specific transitions, and then you project into this your Green's function, and then you have an expression on how this thing, uh, you know, the dissipative couplings between the atoms. And then you could do the same for the, the real part, J i j, where this would be the real part of the Green's function. Okay. So um, you can, uh, oh, then the last thing is like vacuum is basically uh, isotropic. So the only thing that matters here is the relative distance between the particles. Okay, not exactly where they are. So that's why I've written this in terms of R, where R is basically the difference between R i and R j. Okay, so, um, I can now take the limit where uh, the distance between the atoms is uh, zero, and this basically is equivalent to finding the local term of this uh, Green's function. Okay, so if you want this also a self energy, so it's going to tell me about the local decay of an atom in free space and also the frequency shift associated to the fact that vacuum fluctuations change the uh, resonance frequency of the atom. Um, and so the single atom or single spin decay rate is gamma zero, so you just tailor expand this where R goes to zero, you find that. Um, so that's good. Uh, lamp shift, on the other hand, is more problematic. It diverges, uh, so it goes as one over R cube. So the trick here is to say, well, there is this just yields a renormalization of the resonance frequency. So whatever you measure in your experiment that, you know, 200 terahertz is the resonance frequency of the transition for a rubidium atom in blah, blah, blah. Uh, this accounts already for this shift that uh, diverges, but we're taking it to zero because it is inside omega zero. Okay, so this is basically how atoms couple in free space. Uh, now we can think of what happens uh, in a different vacuum. So instead of one 3D vacuum, we're gonna take our vacuum and compress it into one dimension. Uh, which is basically we're going to think of a waveguide or a transmission line. So um, in that case, the Green's function uh, already projected into the dipole uh, matrix element of the atoms look like this. Uh, so you have basically some coupling strength, which I'm now going to call gamma 1D. So gamma 1D over the spontaneous emission rate in vacuum typically is the full cell factor of a dielectric. It just tells you how much of the photon is radiated into the dielectric versus free space. Uh, and then um, the field basically in a medium uh, attenuates geometrically according to the dimension of the medium. Uh, so in 1D, uh, there is no attenuation. Uh, so therefore, 
the field propagates to infinity without any attenuation. Of course, this is not really true because if there is any type of loss in the material or basically if there is a scattering in the surface, this is going to produce some a small a imaginary component to the wave vector K1D and this will produce uh, some loss. But for the rest, I mean, for now, we're going to take that easy. You can, of course, uh, incorporate it. Uh, you can play the same trick. Uh, you can look at the single spin decay rate, taking the limit, and so that is gamma 1D, and the lamp shift in this case is zero because there is no uh, fast, like, uh, there is no strong near fit uh, in this particular case. Okay, so. Uh, Similarly, the actual distance between the atoms or the sorry, the particular positions do not matter. The only thing that matters is the distance. And in this case, not even the distance, but the phase that the field accumulates between one atom and the next one. Okay, so basically, if you take some given distance, uh, such that K1D D is some phase, this would be equivalent as if you pick the same phase plus 2 pi, 4 pi, etc., etc. Uh, so even though these two systems, free space and a wave guide, uh, they look, uh, you know, kind of different, uh, they are, uh, the physics that they realize is uh, surprisingly similar. Uh, and how I think about it is because if I think of, uh, you know, the elements in my master equation, I'm going to have a non-zero Hamiltonian uh, that is going to evolve my states. And then I'm going to have... Uh, more than one jump operator. So it turns out that in free space I have n collective jump operators. In the waveguide I have two jump operators because basically atoms can emit to the right or to the left or a superposition of left plus right to left minus zero. So the fact that you have this uh, type of you know, complex dynamics that can be generated both by collective decay via this uh, number of jump operators and the Hamiltonian uh, makes things uh, at least to my knowledge complicated. Okay, so this is a uh, kind of basics of uh, how, you know, field propagates in these systems. Uh, now we're going to take a look at what happens when you have, uh, we're going to take again the trivial limit. We're going to take the distance between the atoms going to zero. Okay, we're going to place them all in the same position, forgetting in free space about this large one over R cube term. Okay, we're going to set that to zero. And now we're going to have permutational symmetry. So this is when the system becomes very easy to describe. And we're going to look at what happens when we have more than one atom. And basically this, how certain states decay, whether they are, you know, radiative, which we call bright or super radiant, or non-radiative uh, and protected from decay, which we call dark or subradiant. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to just take two atoms or two spins. We take again the distance going to zero. And we're going to look at the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, which becomes uh, very trivial. It's just basically the dissipative part, okay? And there I've written uh, the decay rate, which again is big gamma ij, because it is the same regardless of whether i is j or different, etc., etc. I've set it up to be gamma zero. So now uh, I have two particles. So now I can uh, write my four states in the Hilbert state, which are... Both of them are in the ground state. Uh, both of them are in the excited state. Uh, or I can prepare a superposition uh, either with a plus sign or a minus sign. Okay, so there's a basis of my Hilbert space. And then I can look at what is the decay rate associated to each of these uh, states. So the ground state does not decay. Uh, the excited state decays at twice the single particle decay rate. Uh, and then the, what I call bright state decays also at twice the rate of a single particle. And then I have a completely decoupled dark state, uh, which is basically a spin up, a spin down, minus a spin uh, down, spin up, uh, which is dark. Okay? Uh, so if you were to prepare this state, what you would see is rapid decay to the ground state, and this would be completely decoupled from the dynamics. Uh, on the other hand, if you were able to prepare this state, which may or may not be that trivial, uh, this state will live forever, okay, at least in this time model picture. Uh, and at the level of a single excitation, there is nothing very quantum mechanical about this. You can think of this as interference. So this is constructive interference because the radiation of the two dipoles constructively interferes in the far field, and here the radiation is, uh, you know, destructive interference, and then there is no physical decay. Yeah. 
Yes, but yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you were to prepare something that is, uh, you know, here you would put a face, then it would, these are the normal modes for this uh, subspace. So then you would have like a cling to the bright and the dark, and so there will be a part of it that would naturally decay. Yes. So generically, and I'm gonna talk about, well, yes, so maybe let's go to the next slide. So maybe try, trying to generalize this to an arbitrary number of excitations. Um, I have classified this system to system with permutation and symmetry. So basically a system where there is this all to all coupling and you know, generic. And I'm gonna try this like me drawing some uh, illustrators. I don't know if this really conveys the idea, but I'm gonna try to explain what I mean by this. Um, so in this uh, first case, uh, I have just extended this idea from two uh, particles to many. And then you have this kind of uh, a string of states that are bright and a huge, uh, you know, many other states, some of them are bright, some of them are dark, but they are in principle decoupled from, by symmetry from these states. Um, around the equator, so when you have like a, a, a density of excitations corresponding to about one half of your system, you'll have these very strongly decaying states that the scale, whose decay rate scales as L squared. Uh, so I won't get there today. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, in the following lecture. Uh, so now if you have an extended system and you break this permutation symmetry, now uh, in principle the dynamics is not constrained to this small subspace, it can go all over Hilbert space. Uh, even thinking about what is a good basis, you know, maybe under debate, but what I mean by this picture is, you know, you have a bunch of states, uh, there is, a, you know, decay from one to other and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, because you have these jump operators that are acting on them and they produce this uh, type of decay. On top of that, the Hamiltonian uh, is gonna also scramble you, so it's gonna evolve you in a fixed uh, excitation, uh, in a sector of fixed excitations. Uh, and then what you see, or hope I hope that you see, is that eventually as dynamics happens, you there are some some uh, states from which you cannot really de decay to the ground state. So these are basically dark states. They are not perfectly dark, but it would take the dynamics a long time to take you out uh, from them. Okay, yes. No, no, in principle, no, so just the fact that you have now a uh, um, interaction that depends on the distance does that for you. No, I mean, I'll talk about this uh, in the following lecture. There is, we started thinking of, is there something in between? So in one case, you have this kind of N scaling of the Hilbert space, and in the other type of more general systems, you have this two to the N. So could you go perturbatively or in some other way in between? Uh, and I tell you that in waveguides, you can do that. There are special uh, distances for which you don't have total permutation symmetry, but you have partial permutation symmetry. But still, you have to throw away your Hamiltonian, the coherent part. So it's like it's not, you know, uh, there is like some perturbation there. So I'll, I'll get that in the next uh, uh, lecture. Okay, yes. No, no, the, these states are dark for sure, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, you, if you prepare them, you would actually never get out of them. Whereas here, these dark states are not perfectly dark because the Hamiltonian would kind of like take you out, it would connect you to some bright state. So I'm just saying that if you start from a bright state, typically you don't reach them because they are separated by symmetry. But these are, this is just to say there are dark states, in particular in the case of a cavity if you want, or if you put all the atoms in the same place in a way by, or in free space, they are perfectly dark, perfectly decoupled. That's more or less what I wanted to say. Whereas in general here, you have dark states, they are not perfectly decoupled, and it's kind of a, it's a mess in some sense. Exactly, super long leaf, and the lifetime of them scales with system size, increases with system size. Yes. No, 
No, exactly. So you would, in this particular case, you would see exponential decay through this uh, this channel. Whereas, and actually, this is a great question because it leads me to the next slide. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm gonna talk. You don't have to believe me. I'll show it to you that they are uh, very long lived. But I agree. Like by now, you're like, why would they be long lived? So that's fair. I mean, it is it is believable that as you have more and more particles, uh, these particles can cooperatively uh, produce destructive interference better and better. So they can cancel the emission of like other particles better, right? So. It is believable that uh, at least below some distance, this happens, and they are very long-lived. But you don't have to believe me, I'll show it to you. OK, so then uh, following Benedetta's question, uh, there's been uh, you know, some both theory paper and experimental paper, several of them, uh, both. Uh, and actually thinking about you know, what happens at, you know, when you prepare some excitation, typically with you know, uh, many excitation uh, state. And you let it decay. And so what you see, well, this is a paper actually of uh, Darrick. Uh, what they did is they prepared, I don't know if it's a full inverted state or a highly excitation state. They see decay. And then eventually, you see a deviation from exponential. And they see these long tails emerging that they scale as, instead of e to the minus t, they go to this kind of power law, inverse power law uh, tail. Um, this has been looked at, or a version of this has been looked at in an experiment of Antoine Blowways, where they also, like, in this case, it's, a, it's an order array, this is a disordered cloud. They excite it, and they look at long times, and you see this kind of long tail uh, emerging. Uh, but then, on top of it, you see these kind of bumps. Uh, and this paper is titled Storage and Release of Subradiant um, um, Excitations in a Cloud. Uh, so storage is not like super sophisticated storage, is that naturally as the system decays, it's going to populate dark states naturally. Uh, the release is that at certain points, they, I believe with a laser, they kind of like um, produce the uh, frequency shifts that are inhomogeneous differently uh, for different atoms. And this kind of changes the eigenstates of the system at that particular moment, and this leads to a release of light. And so these are the bumps. And then again, the system settles into some mixed state of dark states, uh, into a mixture of dark states, and then they do it again. And so these are the different bumps that are saying, like, well, there is something that looks like metastable or like long leaf, and then boom, we kind of disturb it. And then again, it goes uh, uh, into this kind of metastable continuum. So, OK, so. The question now is, what do we do with this mess? Uh, well, I'll tell you more about it perhaps uh, the next lecture. But uh, for uh, the lecture today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this region, uh, the region of a single excitation, OK? Because there, in principle, we should be able to answer or look at these states and characterize them properly and easily. Yes? Sorry, just to put the context, there's a mechanism of the excitement about the the theory or the, the that one? Yeah. The, 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 the experience. Yeah, that's experience. No, actually it's not even super radiant. I mean it's more the emphasis is more on the sub radiant part. So it's on the day. Ah no, it's not even that. There is an earlier paper at this one, also on an uh, dense dense ensemble, uh, I think two thousand sixteen. But this was uh, particularly cute because they had this kind of release. So they were acting on these dark states and disturbing them so that you see that there is some excitation stored in them, right? Because you could say, well, maybe I'm just, there is no excitation whatsoever left. And that's why I don't collect any light. But then kind of when you shake it, it kind of gets out. And then again, it kind of becomes muted. So that's why, uh, I mean, to me, that is the highlight of the paper. It's unclear, I mean, it's unclear if that was many body subradiants. Uh, it is believable that when the system decay, it prepares again a mixture of dark states with potentially many excitations. Uh, but uh, 
I don't think it's been characterized the density, you know, as a function of time, at least in our experiment. I mean, in theory, you can do it. I think Susanna was asking us about this. Um, but uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So the literature also is uh, people call things differently also, and then it's hard to even like, this, there are debates, which I really don't have any stake into on like, is it population trapping versus subradiance? Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, so I agree with Eric, there are like a bunch of, uh, you know, old papers at this. Yes, Susan. I see. So subradiant states live in the lower part of this, uh, so they require um, N over two, sorry, uh, excitation below uh, half, basically. Yeah. Uh, because if not, at some point you have so many excitations that you cannot uh, stop this from decaying, in a sense. Okay, so then the last thing I wanted to say about this is that, uh, well, not only this is a bit, uh, you know, it's uh, messy or complicated dynamics, but if you want to harness these dark states for something, this is a terrible way of preparing them, right? Because you have released all of the energy out in terms of photons, and then, you know, uh, there is very little left to populate these dark states. So this is very far from deterministic population of a dark state, which is what you may want to do for in particular vampire applications. Okay, so then uh, what I'm going to tell you today is I'm going to try to characterize these kind of uh, single excitation dark states, and then I'm going to tell you how to prepare them and harness them, okay? Um, okay, so then uh, the easiest way to think about this, as usual, is in 1D. So this is a uh, 1D chain in 3D free space, okay? Uh, uh, my chain is going to be along the C direction. The lattice constant is D. And I'm going to diagonalize the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian and look at the modes. And then Jaroslav asked, Jaroslav asked me the previous uh, day, what do you choose to diagonalize? Why would you choose the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian versus the Lindbladian or the dissipative uh, coupling matrix or whatever? Um, so in this case, so as again, it's, there is a little bit of art to it. It's like depending on the problem you choose, as you saw in physics. Uh, but uh, in particular, this I would say, I would defend this choice uh, for this problem because uh, when you have just a single excitation and you have two level systems, the action of a jump operator is trivial. It only can take you to the ground state. So then if you have a pure state that is a single excitation state and it's evolving with this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, obviously because the Hamiltonian is non-Hermitian, the norm is not going to be preserved, but you know where the rest of the state is going, it is going to the ground state. So, that's why this is a good uh, thing. Another thing you can think about is, in reality, when you have a single excitation, this problem is classical, so you could think of this as a classical array of dipoles. You can look at uh, um, you know, the dynamics of the system, and naturally you can think of this as like a couple equations for the dipoles uh, induced by 
if you drive the system with light. And what you would see is that in this couple equations, what appears is not just the real part of the Green's function or imaginary part, but both, like the total Green's function. Okay, so then um, what uh, we're going to take uh, to begin with, we're going to consider an infinite chain. Uh, and so if it's an infinite chain, we can uh, diagonalize the Hamiltonian in momentum space uh, using a spin waves. So we're going to consider a creation operator uh, that is, you know, it prepares a spin wave with momentum k. And it uh, just start with a ground state that is the product of all atoms in the ground state. You act with this spin wave. And when you look at the dispersion relation of such a spin wave, uh, which is equivalent to look at uh, the action of the natural Poisson Hamiltonian, you're going to see that it has uh, indeed a dispersion relation that comes from the real part of the Hamiltonian. So it means this is going to cost you some energy according to, you know, the dispersion, I mean, the momentum. But interestingly, there's going to be also an imaginary part. So now this is like an imaginary, if you wish, uh, dispersion relation that tells you that if you prepare an excitation with uh, or a spin wave with momentum k, depending on that momentum, this excitation can be radiated after some time, which is one over gamma k, or it will stay there forever if gamma k is zero. Okay, so then uh, let me introduce or, uh, you know, remind you of the concept that uh, uh, Susan introduced, the light cone. So now, um, because this uh, periodic system, I'm going to work in the Briou and Song that is defined from minus pi over d to pi over d. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to have some dispersion relation that I, here I draw by hand, okay? It's not that important. Uh, it is centered around the resonance frequency of the atom, omega zero. Uh, and then I can divide my Briou and Son in two pieces, uh, one that falls inside the light cone and one that falls outside. So what is the light cone? The light cone is basically pairs of frequency and wave vector that are compatible with propagation of photons in free space. So a photon that propagates in free space can have an arbitrary momentum given that it has a fixed frequency, okay? So this is what uh, the light cone tells you, is like inside is radiative, outside is non-radiative, okay? So these modes, should, we should expect them to be dark, and these modes, we should expect them to be bright. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the imaginary part of the dispersion relation. I'm going to tweak it a bit. So this light cone, even though it has this triangular shape, the bandwidth of this dispersion relation is super tiny. It's of the order of gamma zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom into this uh, very small section of this light cone. So suddenly this light cone that looks like a triangle is going to look vertical. Okay? So this is how it looks like. So this is the decay rate normalized to the single spin decay rate. This is the wave vector along C. And you see that the decay rate is finite inside the light cone and exactly zero outside the light cone. And what is the edge of the, or what limits the, the light cone is the light line is omega zero over C, because this is the maximum wave vector for a photon that propagates in the C direction. So, uh, how can we understand this? Uh, well, this is a simple momentum mismatch. At some point, if you prepare an excitation with a wave vector that is too large for a photon to have in free space, it cannot couple. And the way of thinking about this is that the, both the momentum along C, KC, and the momentum in the transfer di direction, K perpendicular, a square, they have to be K0 a square. So basically, if KC is larger than K0, K perpendicular has to be imaginary. So this is basically an excitation that has an evanescent field in the transverse plane. So it means it's really localized to the chain. Okay, uh, well, one last thing I should say is this in 1D only happens for below a particular distance, that is the resonance uh, wavelength divided by two. Uh, there is an obvious way of seeing that this should happen. Uh, that is the following. If I take my distance to be super large, the atoms should not interact. There should not be dark states. Equivalently for the bridge and zone, if I take the distance to be very large, I'm going to make my Briou and Son very, very small, and eventually everything fits inside the light cone. As now I make the distance smaller, what I'm doing is I'm stretching the Briou and Son, and then I have more and more density of dark states. And this transition at which the edge of the Briou and Son hits K0 is lambda 0. Okay, so then the natural question is, well, you know, I 
mean, uh, what is infinity life? Nothing, no, I guess. So uh, then what happens if now you have a finite system with n particles? Uh, for this, then you have to build your non-Hermitian Hamiltonian and diagonalize it, which is actually trivial uh, because it's an n by n matrix, okay? So you do that uh, and you look at the most subradiant states and you, pl you plot the lifetime or the decay rate versus n and this is what you find. Uh, you can fit it and it goes as 1 over n cubed. So now answering Jamir's uh, comment, uh, this is why I was calling them, you know, long-lived because their lifetime is 1 over n cubed. Yes? The, so what I can tell you is, for instance, if you were to close close this chain, uh, this uh, so you can think of why is this thing radiating at all? Is you can think of this actually as a waveguide, where it's guiding light not because of total internal refraction, but because of destructive interference. And actually, this is in photonics people call this a wavelength creating waveguide. So this is something that people do with silicon. Uh, and the only reason why it radiates is because it has edges. So you could ask, what, what if I close it and I make a ring, and then this becomes exponentially suppressed, the decay ring. Uh, because now it's like a resonator, in some sense. Uh, I'm sure, well, no, I mean, no, I cannot promise it. Uh, I would say it's likely, or at least uh, versions of uh, of this. If it's not exactly dipoles, it could be like yeah, pieces of material, etc., etc. This is kind of generic. You don't even need like again like exactly dipoles to do that. No, you could yeah, you could engineer. I recall people have looked at uh, SSH model versions of these where you put one close and the other. Right? You can always like do all these type of things. I cannot promise you that it has been done. I wouldn't be shocked if it, uh, no, I wouldn't be shocked. I would be, I would think it's possible that somebody has done it, but not, I cannot point you to it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So anyway. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, but you could couple it to us, some non-reciprocal, or you could add like some drive, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, just what I meant is just this Hamiltonian won't give you this, but you can modify the Hamiltonian to display this type of effects. Okay. Uh, and then, as I said, well, what does this mean? Well, this is really like a waveguide. It radiates at the edges. You can look at the intensity profile, which you can build from the input-output equation that I showed you before from the field, and you see that it radiates at the edge. Lo and behold, that's it. Uh, so radiant states. And this radiation is little, okay, of course. Okay. It's radiating the edge. It's yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Totally classic. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, uh, when we saw these things, like, well, you know, now it's really like a waveguide, right? So then, boom, atomic waveguide 3D. What if you now have, like, an impurity coupled to the array? And this is actually what uh, Susan was uh, uh, mentioning the other day. So we did for 1D, and then Susan also did for 2D, and people did for a ring, and then it took, like, it went out of a bit of control, 3D, and then, like, diver impurity, you know, like, you can do all types of uh, cool stuff. Okay. So this 1D, now what happens in 2D? In 2D, uh, something very similar happens. So this is the Brillouin sum for 2D arrays. And uh, here, this light cone basically is like this circle. And you see that at the edge, you have these very bright modes. Um, and outside, uh, the decay rate is zero, OK? Uh, of course, uh, again, atoms are, uh, you know, have some polarization. So uh, the specifics of the, these details depend on the polarization, but uh, it's not critical. And you could also say, well, what if I don't have 3D vacuum and I have 1D vacuum? I told you that this uh, physics was ki kind of generic. And so this is the decay rate uh, for a 1D chain coupled to a 1D waveguide. Um, and you see that this is log scale. So this is super dark. This is super dark. And you only have two bright modes, which correspond to the chain emitting exactly to the right with the wave vector of the waveguide or to the left. Okay. So now what happens if you have... Um, you know, 
become a bit more creative and you want to do a bit more quantum mechanical things, and then you think of two excitations. So two excitations, uh, you can think of, okay, what if I have a single excitation and I, you know, I produce it twice? Well, this is not an eigenstate of the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian because these are not bosons, they are spins. But you can look at the two excitation sector of this Hamiltonian and diagonalize it. And, and what you see is that the most subradiant states uh, actually admit a fermionic ansatz. So what do I mean by this? You take the most subradiant eigenstate, the second most subradiant eigenstate, you anti-symmetrize them. Uh, and this ansatz has a very high fidelity with the two excitation dark state that looks like this, where you see that the amplitude where i equals j is zero. So it's some sort of Pauli kind of exclusion in free space. Uh, perhaps not that surprising because, you know, you cannot excite an atom twice. Uh, and this was uh, um, studied in a paper of Thang and Molmer where they looked at a bit of a two excitation zoology. They kind of diagonalized the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, looked at different states. They saw these kind of fermionized states. Many of the states are uh, fermionic, the fidelity is high, but uh, these are dark states. But there are also other types of uh, two excitation dark states. So, yeah. Again, yeah, I'm sure you can find one and call it something and then it's your dark state. But, um, okay, and I should say uh, that actually most of this work is uh, work that I did as a postdoc and uh, actually this was a gift of Derek uh, to me when I was a postdoc where it was like, let's think about dark states in chains. And I was like, okay. So then uh, that was pretty good, uh, pretty fun. And then we wrote a very long PRX paper about it. Uh, but then you don't need to read it because I'm telling you the highlights. Okay, so now uh, the interesting is, thing is like, I told you there are dark states, I've characterized them. But if something is dark, you cannot couple to it. So what do we do to couple these dark states and how can we use them? Uh, so there are different uh, ways of doing that. Uh, so people among them, I mean, this is a paper also of Derek, a paper of uh, Ignacio Girac. How to couple to dark states? One possibility is to use uh, two photons to overcome this momentum mismatch to do some type of uh, uh, transition of that point. So I won't talk that much about it. Um, feel free to check out the, these papers. Uh, there is an alternative way to look at, uh, to couple to a dark state, that is to couple your chain to a different path, okay? And in particular, if you have an array and it's dark to free, I mean, it sustains modes that are dark to free space, if you now proximitize it with a waveguide, now a waveguide has a refractive index that is larger than one, which means it supports guided modes. And our mode is guided precisely because it doesn't fall in the light cone. So then the dispersion uh, in blue here will eventually intersect the dark state dispersion. And so a photon that comes through the waveguide would naturally prepare a state that is dark to free space and bright to the waveguide. And this is what we call selective radiance because it radiates selectively. And actually it's not only selectively, it radiates very appropriately because typically what you want is something that interacts strongly or efficiently with some particular optical mode that you care about that you're going to collect and very quickly with dissipation channels, which would be free space in this case. So, okay, now uh, that's great. We can now couple to dark states and these dark states are actually not dark anymore. They are dark to the bad reservoir and bright to the good one. So now how can we use them uh, to do anything. Uh, so then let me introduce very briefly the notion of optical depth. Uh, so you can recall uh, Suzanne's uh, talk about the mirror, which basically tells us, told us, told us that uh, the mirror works very well because what it does is effectively it increases the uh, scattering cro cross section of a single atom. So now you have very uh, efficient light matter interface because of this cooperative phenomenon. So now let me just show you how it works with a waveguide. So imagine that you have a single atom and you send light to the, from the side. Uh, what would mean to interact efficiently with this single atom is if this atom uh, reflects the light, uh, you know, 100%. Okay. So you can compute the reflectance of this uh, system uh, very simply because you have the input-output equation. So, you know, if you want to entertain yourself this afternoon, you have the input-output equation and you have the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. From there, you can look at the steady state of the atomic coherence. And from there, you, via the input-output equation, you can compute the transmission and reflection. So when you do that, you see that the reflection of a single atom goes, the reflectance goes as one. So it is a perfect mirror. 
minus 4 over d, where d is called the optical depth, which is gamma 1d over gamma prime. So what you want for light to interact efficiently in this uh, 1d channel is you want to boost the decay rate from the atom to the waveguide, gamma 1d versus free space. So you want to enhance the good coupling versus the bad one. Okay. So now you could do that just by putting more atoms. So if you put more atoms, this uh, um, um, what's the name? Uh, optical depth increases linearly with system size. And actually this optical depth does not only impact how well an atom reflects light, but it is a figure of merit that appears in most protocols involving single or two excitation physics, such as quantum memories or gates between photons. So everything is about boosting the optical depth in a cavity that is called cooperative, co cooperativity. Okay, so then uh, in this, uh, in what I told you here, there is a huge assumption that this, that the emission into the bad channel to free space is, uh, you know, a single atom process is independent, but I just told you that you have dark states. So this means now that if you can couple to this selectively radiant states, this gamma prime depends on N, in particular will be suppressed with N very uh, strongly. Uh, and this means that your optical depth can be way more than super linear with system size. And this would improve the protocols of, uh, you know, the performance of most quantum computing protocols. Okay, so then as an example, very briefly, what we did is we looked at a quantum memory. So a quantum memory, even though it's called quantum, there is very much nothing quantum about it. It's just like how to store light into a three-level system. You can think of uh, this three-level system. There is a ground state, a metastable state S. Uh, you couple uh, via the waveguide um, to the ground to excited state transition, and you shine continuously a control field that will drive the population from the E to the S state. Okay, so this creates what is called a transparency window or like EIT processes, such that this makes the, the medium, the atomic medium transparent. And in particular, if you modify temporally the control field, uh, you can even stop light and store it in, form, in the form of an atomic excitation. So then the problem is that when you want to store or retrieve this light, uh, you're going to do a process that is basically you have to, once the light is stored in this superposition of ground and excited state into all of the atoms, when you retrieve it, you have to go through the excited state. And when you decay from this excited state, you can decay via the waveguide, which is good, or via free space. And so this would yield loss. So you want to suppress that. And so you can do that via the selective radiance. And when we looked at the result, including selective radiance, you have the infidelity, which is the error in the retrieval of this photon that you have stored in your memory versus atom number. This is the conventional performance that is 1 over n, the inverse of the optical depth. And you see that you can exponentially improve it. You have to work a bit hard with exponential, but and hopefully you will believe my polynomial scaling. You work a bit more, you get into exponential. So, yeah, pretty nice. Uh, oh, well, I have a thing here. Okay, and then uh, we just uh, decided that why let's... Uh, Stop there, we can, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so uh, the intuition is the following. Um, so I told you that most of the loss happens at the edges of this chain. Um, so, and I also told you that this chain behaves like a waveguide. So you could think of you have a waveguide and on top of it, the atoms form another waveguide. And you want to pass this photon that comes from here to your atomic waveguide. So what you do is what you do in photonics, you just taper it. And so you look, you kind of modify the control field spatially to suppress excitation at the edges. And that's where you get the exponential Okay, and then uh, you can do this quantum memory not only in a waveguide, but also in free space. Uh, you lose a bit of the performance, but it's, just, it's still uh, better than one over n. Uh, and then you can take it further and start looking at uh, quantum nonlinear uh, processes. So this is a paper uh, suggested by Derek, but also Suzanne has some suggestion on how to basically perform gates with the mirror. Uh, and so uh, I don't, I won't get into this. I don't know if I have time, but the idea is that, uh, or the basics behind it is that again, uh, your perf optical performance is enhanced because you really. Uh, emit most of the light into the channel that you're detecting, and so your protocol works better, both for single and free excitation physics. 
Of course, this has a huge drawback, uh, in particular if you do it in, in free space, that is, uh, I told you that it requires in 1D distances below uh, lambda over 2, and in 2D uh, distances below lambda. Uh, so this is a recent paper from uh, uh, Derek's group where, I mean, you can see this is the maximum reflectance of the mirror, um, and you see that this reflectance goes to 1 and kind of drops after the lattice constant becomes super lean, uh, super uh, wavelength. Uh, but then you could um, pay that price of, uh, you know, you could tolerate larger lattice constants, which is better if you're trapping atoms with optical tweezers. It's hard to bring them close. Uh, if you now have multiple layers. So with multiple layers, and you see here monolayer, bilayer, three layer, and you see how this reflectance error decreases. So this is a way of getting this physics or something similar to this type of improved uh, cooperativity or improved optical depth physics uh, without having to pay the price of the small lattice constants. Okay, so this is uh, kind of a summary. Uh, I have told you that uh, subradiant states exist in these uh, arrays, both in free space and in waveguides. They are protected from decay. Uh, you can use uh, selective radiance to realize improved light matter interfaces. And I'm going to tell you what I don't like about this, uh, which is a bunch of stuff. Uh, so dark states are not very robust. I mean, when I gave this talk before, I'm like, yeah, dark states are cool. Uh, they are somewhat robust. It's not that if you move the atoms a little bit, everything gets destroyed. But uh, if the atomic position is not perfect, then if also the, the atoms can move, if they are not perfectly trapped in the lattice, the same in a waveguide, if you imprint your, uh, your uh, defects in a waveguide, if there is an homogeneous broadening, if there is non-radiative decay rates, etc., etc., this is going to kind of kill at least a bit your performance of the, your dark state. So that's what I mean as robots. They are not like topologically protected. Uh, how to harness them or harness selective radiance is not exactly trivial. So I have shown you some examples, but it's not like you tell me a system, something you want to improve. I'm like, yes, this is how you do it. Like, I need to think about it. Uh, I don't know if Derek has, I need to think about it. So, you know, it's like, uh, it's a process. Uh, there is no clear recipe. Uh, and then, uh, more importantly, what is harder, definitely harder, is how to harness these dark states at the multi-excitation level. Uh, how to control them. So, can you prepare dark states that are entangled, that are interesting for metrology, for computation, that are protected from decay? That's very much non-trivial. And there is no obvious recipe how to get to that from the single excitation uh, subspace. Okay, and so the last thing that I wanted to tell you is a preview of lecture three. So in lecture three, we're gonna be unchained. So let's forget about fixing the excitation density. We're gonna really look at uh, really many body physics uh, and discuss what is the largest possible decay rate in, 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 a, in a system, in a very generic Markovian system. And to do that, we're going to harness some tools from Hamiltonian complexity theory, even though this is a difficult problem. And I will tell you also some applications and among them something that we've been thinking about that is how to interpolate between, again, like this kind of easy kind of uh, permutation asymmetric cavity to kind of generic uh, hardness of uh, free space. Thank you.